today we're going to talk about the basics of equine nutrition and how to evaluate feed and supplement labels to help determine that we are providing good quality nutrition for our horses. First, let's take a quick look at a really simplified version of the digestion process. Digestion actually starts in the mouth of the horse. So horses have to be able to properly chew their feed and forage into smaller particle sizes in order to aid in efficient nutrient utilization. This is one reason why it is so, so important to have an annual dental workup done on your horse. Now the saliva, which is only produced when a horse actually chews, also contains enzymes that help aid in digestion, as well as act as a natural buffer to the stomach acid. So keeping lungs and forage available can really help naturally protect that stomach. Now after the food passes down the esophagus and into the foregut or stomach, Gastric acid helps break down the nutrients to then be absorbed in the small and large intestines. The small intestine is actually where most of our nutrient absorption occurs. So proteins, fats, starches, and sugars, and most of your vitamins and minerals will be absorbed in this part of the digestive tract. And then from there, our unabsorbed fiber continues into the cecum, where it is broken down by billions of little microorganisms. Horses are what is called hindgut fermenters, and so they actually use that fiber that is broken down, um, turn it into something called volatile fatty acids, and then it is absorbed and used as energy. From there, mostly water is absorbed, um, but then anything that hasn't been utilized at this point is then excreted as waste. So it's really important that we try to optimize the utilization of this feed and forage and the nutrients that we're providing in the digestive tract, not only for the health and just general well-being of that horse, but also just from an economical standpoint. Now, the most important nutrient for a horse is actually water. In general, the average thousand pound horse will typically consume between five and 10 gallons of water per day in moderate temperature with no exercise. Now, when temperature increases or exercise is added, that can actually increase by up to three times. Now, a study was conducted that found that optimum water consumption occurred between 45 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, optimum water consumption occurred between those temperatures. So that doesn't mean that a horse won't consume water outside of those ranges, but what was found was that the more, or that more water was actually consumed within that, those temperatures. So providing clean, cool, fresh water daily is really incredibly important to the health of your horse. Just for an example, a healthy horse in moderate temperature on average can live about 21 days with only access to water and no feed or forage. But that same horse in the same health conditions in the same environment can only live about seven days when he has no water but access to feed and forage. So three times longer with just water compared to that of uh, having something to eat. One way to help encourage water consumption is by providing just plain white table salt, sodium chloride, daily. Sodium actually helps encourage water consumption. Um, and the average sized horse, so again, around that thousand pounds, has a, a minimum requirement that breaks down into about two pounds per month of table salt. So think about a four pound salt block and think about if your horse consumes half of that salt block in a month. In most cases, the answer is gonna be no, um, but by providing plain white table salt, which I call force feeding salt, where you top dress it on top of the feed, at the rate of one tablespoon per 500 pounds of body weight per day, we can not only meet that sodium requirement, but also help encourage that water consumption. All right, so ideally, horses would have um, access to forage 24 hours a day. Um, really, they are designed to eat about 18 hours a day of poor quality long stem forage. Another study was conducted where horses were stalled for about 12 hours at a time. They had no access to feed or forage, 
And what they found was that eight of those 12 hours, horses still performed what they called grazing behaviors. So they still mimicked that mechanical act of chewing, but with nothing to eat. So what happened was these horses started developing, developing um, bored and anxious behaviors such as pacing, wood chewing, and even sh eating shavings. So the average horse in that study ate about seven pounds per day of shavings, not the kind of fiber that we want to provide in the diet for that horse. Um, but on top of that, the lack of lungs and forage passing to the stomach can greatly increase instances of gastric ulcers and digestive disturbances. So ideally, a horse would have access 24-7. However, if we're managing intake, they really should be fed at a minimum of 1.5% one of their total desired body weight per day from forage or high fiber source. So a 1,000 pound horse typically consumes about or needs to consume a minimum of 15 pounds per day. Really important that we weigh our hay because that can make a big difference um, if we're feeding 15 pounds of a three pound a day, or sorry, three pound per flake hay, that's five flakes. If we're feeding um, a five pound per flake, that's only three flakes. So um, weighing hay is just as important as weighing your feed. Now for underweight horses, um, that's really simple. Absolutely, if we can offer free choice forage, the bet, uh, that's better. And then supplementing with no more than 50% from a higher quality source like alfalfa to provide some higher calories and a little bit more digestible forage. Now for our overweight horses, we still want to provide them around one and a half percent of their body weight. Um, if we start creeping lower, that's a good opportunity to work with a nutritionist to figure out what the best route is for your horse. Um, for really obese horses. But what we can do is utilize certain tools like slow feed hay nets or grazing muzzles to help slow down that consumption. This will allow that horse to still have plenty of access, um, but reduces how much they can eat per bite. So then why do we feed feed? There are some scenarios where we need to add a concentrate to the diet to help maybe provide extra calories or better quality protein. Ideally, feed would be provided to um, give things like vitamins and minerals that are not available at adequate levels in the forage. If you think about a horse in the wild, they've got thousands and thousands of acres to free range on a variety of species of grass that are all gonna provide a little bit new, different nutrient profile. Um, they also don't exercise in the wild like they do in captivity. So that makes a difference in what we need to provide them as well. So I, however, would tend to argue that a main reason that we actually give feed is because it makes us feel good. I don't know about you guys, but there's nothing that makes me feel better than when I walk up to the fence, shake a bucket of feed, and my horse comes running. Because that's probably the only time that that actually happens. So since it makes us feel good and we want to make sure that we are doing the best for our animal, there are some tools and things that you can use to help make a little bit more educated decision when choosing your nutrition program and just have a better understanding as to why you're choosing to go that route. Now first, I want to say that not all nutrients are created equal. What would you think if I told you that I could take leather from this boot, mix it with shavings, and pour motor oil on it, run it through a pellet mill, and actually make a horse feed pellet that would provide protein, fat, and fiber percentages? Now, do you think if we fed that feed to your horse that those ingredients would provide nutrients that would be usable? Probably not. But fortunately, there's a lot of regulations that don't allow ingredients like this into a horse feed. But the point is, is that just because something provides protein, for example, that doesn't mean that it's actually bioavailable or usable by the horse. So the quality of ingredient really does play a role in how effectively the animal can utilize that nutrient. If it's not being absorbed, it is then being passed as waste. So the very first thing that I look at when I'm looking at labels is the ingredient list. Um, this is what we would call a closed label. So this is where all the ingredients are listed 
um, in what we call collective terms. It legally allows the company to really easily swap out ingredients based on the price of the commodities market in order to keep bag prices down. So for each of these terms, there is a list of ingredients that could be roughly 20 ingredients long that can be substituted in order to satisfy that feed label. So if we're changing the ingredients frequently, as frequently as the commodity market changes, which could be weekly, daily, monthly, we would essentially be changing that feed just as frequently. What is the number one rule of thumb when we change a horse's diet? We transition them over the course of one to two weeks typically. So not only does this really create a lot of inconsistency, but it also doesn't tell us a lot about what ingredients are actually being used in that feed. Now this second label is what's called an open label. This allows us to read each ingredient by its true name, therefore giving you um, a little bit more information about the type and the quality of the ingredient that's actually going into the product. An open label, however, does not indicate that the ingredients are not being changed um, or is what's called a locked formula, meaning that ingredients don't change, creating the most consistent diet for the animal. Uh, the only way to determine if your feed is a locked formula is to actually contact the manufacturer. At Blue Bonnet Feeds, all of our equine feeds are locked formula to create the most consistency for that horse. All right, so the next thing I go to is the guaranteed analysis. Believe it or not, but these two products are similarly priced. But look at what you get at the one in the one on the right versus the one on the left. Um, what many don't realize is that anything that is presented at a specific value under that guaranteed analysis must, by law, meet that guarantee. So the larger that guaranteed analysis is, the more the company is being transparent and sticking their neck out to show you that this is exactly what is in the feed and this is what it's providing. A company can put whatever they want in their marketing or even sprinkle it in their ingredient list, um, but if they don't actually guarantee it at a specific value, they're not actually telling you that there's even enough really to register um, or be beneficial to the horse. The USDA can actually come into any feed store or feed mill at any time and sample any product. Anything that is guaranteed on that tag is legal to be analyzed and it must meet that requirement um, or that guarantee in order to avoid penalties. So when you're comparing products, um, especially on price, be sure that you're comparing apples to apples because you might not always be getting what you pay for. The next thing um, are feeding directions. So nutritionists actually spend hours formulating products to make sure that they meet those specific needs um, and provide the correct nutrients at the appropriate levels and in correct ratio to each other based on um, that particular feed. So feeding directions can help identify, um, really it's designed to help identify how much needs to be fed in order to meet the minimum vitamin and mineral requirements based off the guaranteed analysis. So maybe less so than actually keeping the weight on the horse. Um, but for example, uh, this particular product, this is actually Blue Bonnet Feeds Intensify Omega Force. It has a really low feeding rate. So for a horse in light activity, it has a feeding rate of three pounds for a thousand pound horse minimum. Now, let's say we have a horse that's in light work, that's a thousand pounds, but is overweight and can't consume three pounds of this feed for, per day because it's just too many calories. Feeding less is actually a disservice to that animal because we aren't actually providing the vitamin and mineral components that make this feed so great. So this is a scenario, just for an example, where you could use a diet balancer to help provide some of those much needed vitamins and minerals without adding unnecessary calories. On the flip side of that, if we have a horse that's a hard keeper or is underweight, I typically don't recommend feeding over the highest feeding rate on the tag. Um, so for intense activity, that's excluding breeding and growing horses. Their requirements are just completely different. So in this example, eight pounds a day for a thousand pound horse would be the maximum that I would recommend for a hard keeper. First, horses are not designed to eat large dense meals. They're designed to eat long sim forage spread out over a long period of time. 
Um, second, if a horse is consuming plenty of good quality hay and is still unable to maintain weight on eight pounds a day, especially of a very, very calorie nutrient dense feed, I typically recommend looking into other factors like potential digestive issues um, to help address the cause of why the horse is unable to maintain weight. Um, last, and particularly in these fortified feeds that provide a large guarantee analysis, a really uh, dense nutrient package, overfeeding these products and or top dressing with numerous supplements that have a lot of uh, vitamins and minerals in them can really lead to something that we call overnutrition. Now, believe it or not, this is the exact same horse six months apart. Um, the horse on the left was actually eating significantly larger amounts of feed with a variety of supplements compared to the horse on the right. Now, in a similar scenario, um, not this horse in particular, um, we had a customer who had a multiple world champion horse that he was trying to get some extra bloom on before he took her to the next world show. In my opinion, the horse looked awesome, um, but he was really interested in trying one of our products and just wanted to see if he could get a little bit more condition out of her. So his existing feeding program consisted of 12 pounds a day of a local, just economy feed, 12 protein, 3% fat, um, with a very, very minimal vitamin mineral package. He free choiced good quality grass hay, supplemented with a little bit of alfalfa, and then he top dressed his feed with a good quality vitamin and mineral. So he was actually covering all of his bases by adding those nutrients to the feed. My recommendation was to slowly decrease that feeding rate onto that intensify omega force and to decrease it down to eight pounds a day due to the fact that it was four times more fat than the other product. The ingredient quality was different, the added digestive support. And then I strongly encouraged him to eliminate top dressing with that vitamin and mineral because it was already being provided in the feed. After about three weeks, I get a phone call stating that the horse had lost weight, had very little energy, was losing muscle, and that her coat was really dull and brittle. You can imagine I was terrified. So after uh, going to his facility, we went through what he was feeding, and it turned out that he was actually feeding 16 pounds a day of that feed of Omega Force and was continuing to top dress with that vitamin and mineral supplement. Now keep in mind, this is an extreme case, um, but what, what was likely occurring was that that horse's organs were actually overworking, trying to process all of those excess nutrients. Um, and so really it couldn't expend any extra energy in gaining weight or maintaining muscle or having a shiny coat. Uh, once we removed the vitamin and mineral and decreased the feeding rate, she actually began to turn around again within a few weeks. So that is why it's really important to understand what products you're feeding um, and if you're feeding any supplements, if there are nutrients that are being doubled up on that could potentially cause issues. Working with a professional equine nutritionist can help you evaluate overages or recognize gaps in the horse's nutrition program to um, avoid some of these issues. Okay. Now, minerals are a very vital part of the equine diet. Um, if you think about a horse in nature, again, as I mentioned, they have access to all those different variety of grasses containing different nutrients. So they're being provided uh, that pretty regularly. They also aren't stalled or hauled or asked to exercise. So a little bit different um, when we're comparing those hor horses um, that we have to those in uh, the wild. But uh, in captivity, you know, they're limited to small spaces, one grass species. Um, some horses will actually get up to two different types of hay, so that's almost a, a treat for them to have variety. Um, but they really need the nutrients provided in the diet just to maintain normal bodily functions as you take a look at this list. I mean, um, hair coat, appetite, muscle development, all those are just kind of normal uh, processes that need to happen within the body. Um, 
but obviously the level of nutrition is going to be dependent on frequency of exercise. Um, but the best way that it's been explained to me on the importance of vitamins and minerals um, is to compare it to a bank account and paying your rent or mortgage every month. So every month you are required to pay rent. And as long as you deposit your paycheck into your bank account on a regular basis, you will have that ability to pay that bill every month, hopefully. <laughs> um, what happens when you stop depositing money into your bank account? Rent is still due, but now you no longer have the funds in order to pay that bill. So the same thing goes for vitamins and minerals in a horse. Horses need them daily, and as long as they're being provided in the diet at adequate levels, that horse can pull from that mineral bank and utilize it in the body. But if we're not providing it in the diet, that horse's body is still gonna seek those nutrients, but they will now go into a deficit because they can no longer pull from that storage bank. Sometimes that can take years to even express outwardly. Um, now, take a look at this sentence. What is missing? It's the letter I. So this sentence should read, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So I want you to think about letters in the alphabet. There are 26 of them. All of them are needed at some point in order to create different sentences, right? Some letters we use more frequently than others, but if we're missing a letter, we don't have a complete sentence, as you see in this slide. Amino acids work in the same way in proteins. So think about a protein molecule as being your sentence, and think about the amino acids as being the letters that complete that sentence. There are 22 amino acids, 10 of which are considered essential, meaning that they must be provided in the diet. The non-essentials are actually synthesized in the body. All 22 are required to make a protein molecule. However, some are needed and used more frequently than others. These amino acids actually help explain the quality of a protein. So lysine, for example, is what we call the first limiting amino acid. Basically, it limits how much we can have of the other amino acids, so it's a good initial indicator of uh, protein quality. So here we have two examples of uh, protein that we might find on a feed label. Label one, is, or A, is a 14% protein with a half a percent lysine, and label B is a 12% protein with a 0.7 lysine. With a simple math equation, uh, we can actually find out that we get more absorbable protein out of that 12% protein than we do the 14% because of the amino acids, specifically starting with lysine. So there's a lot more to this concept than just looking at lysine, but it helps explain that amino acids um, really play an important role in absorbability in protein. Um, another point to make is that horses don't actually have a percent requirement of protein that they need to meet per day. It's really a gram requirement. And that protein percentage really correlates to the amount of grams that are provided. And all of that is relative to how much is fed. So for example, if you feed one pound of a 30% protein, it will provide the exact same amount of grams of protein as two pounds of a 15% protein. So I put this into a picture. And basically, I hope you can appreciate that the one on the right is just a double version of the one on the left. But what it shows is that when you take 1%, I'm sorry, 30% of one pound, it actually ends up being the same amount of protein as 15% of two pounds, provides the exact same amount of grams. So, all right, so from there, we commonly hear that protein makes horses hot. Um, horses don't actually get energy from protein. Um, if you have a horse that is pulling energy from protein, you are uh, probably lacking uh, calories in the diet. So um, the thing that typically makes a horse excitable or hot is something called NSC or non-structural carbohydrate. 
NSC is the percent of starches plus the percent of sugar. Now, there is no industry standard as to what constitutes low starch or low sugar, except in metabolic horses. So in metabolic horses, their total diet, so that's their feed and their forage, must be below 12% total NSC. Um, take a look at this uh, chart below. You'll notice oats, which is a popular feed, is a 50% total NSC. So four times higher the amount of starch and sugars than what we would re recommend for a horse with a metabolic condition. Um, intensify omega force, 15%, still falls outside of that range, but as you can see, it's a much lower starch and sugar level, much less likely to cause that spike in glucose uh, compared to something like oats. So when we go back to the protein um, question, I like to compare it to eating a food that's really high in protein. So for me, that I think salmon, and then I compare that to drinking a soda or eating cake. So even though you're going to get nutrients in salmon that are going to provide energy, it's um, very low starch and sugar. Um, so it provides like a slow burning energy versus drinking that soda where you get that quick extreme spike in glucose, which can cause excitability. Um, so it's the same reason that parents don't feed kids candy before going to bed. Um, all right. Digestive support is another component that can help horses better utilize their feed and forage um, and just help improve overall health and performance. There have been studies in humans that have found direct links between the gut and the brain and that disruptions in the gut can have negative effects on the brain. In humans, they found that conditions like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, all of these can be linked to disruptions of the gut bacteria. In horses, what they found is that translated into poor weight or hard keeper, picky eater, um, reduced performance, dull coat, uh, chronic ulcers, chronic diarrhea, chronic colic, and even reduced immune system. So things like skin and food allergies. Um, there are several different options to provide di uh, digestive support. We'll just touch on a few, um, but pre and prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes have been found to be effective at addressing digestive issues and inefficiencies. So prebiotics are the food that feed the living microorganisms, and they've been uh, they found through research to help improve nutrient absorbability and immune function. Probiotics are the actual living microorganisms and have also been found through research to help increase digestive efficiency, um, aka nutrient utilization. And then digestive enzymes um, are actually produced in the body, um, but these are keys that unlock nutrient bonds so that the nutrient can be absorbed. So by adding more keys to the diet, we can unlock more bonds, therefore absorbing more nutrients. All three of these examples are designed to help maximize digestion, to help reduce the amount that is not utilized and excreted as waste. So just getting more out of what we're feeding the horse. So last but not least, when making a comparison, we look at cost per head per day, or for me, I like cost per head per month because I do all of my finances based on a monthly cost. So this is the best way to determine what feed will actually cost you. To determine cost per head per day or per month, you take the bag price, divide it by the pounds uh, per bag, and that gets you the cost per pound. Then you take the cost per pound and multiply that by the actual amount of pounds that you feed, and that will give you the cost per day. Obviously, to extrapolate that over a month, multiply that by 30. So here I put Omega Force at $30 a bag. That's going to be high in some areas, low in others. I just kind of went for a middle average, but it's a 50 pound bag, so 60 cents per pound. Um, that minimum feeding rate for the 1,000 pound horse and light work breaks down to about $54 a month. These other two feeds that I show on this uh, comparison chart are retail for $17 a bag. They're 50 pound bags. The minimum feeding rate based on the feeding directions, again, a good important reason why to read the feeding directions, 
is five pounds a day for a thousand pound horse in light work. So $51 a month. So for $3 more a month, when we take a look at the uh, difference in nutrient package, we actually can get a lot more out of that $30 a bag feed than we can the $17 a bag feed. All right, so although things like manufacturing practices, um, inclusion rate of certain nutrients, and even just the quality of customer support that are, are um, available are not things that we can find on a feed tag, but there are many ways that we can help use feed labels to really help determine that we are providing good quality usable nutrients for our horses. If you have any other additional questions, please contact um, us at bluebonnetfeeds.com or strideanimalhealth.com. We will get you in touch with a nutrition consultant to help answer any of your questions.